Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to PRI's webinar, The Biosimilar Promise, How Biosimilars Reform Could Save Patients and Taxpayers Even More. Uh, I'm Tim Anaya. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications here at PRI. And I'm going to be your moderator for today's panel discussion and webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know about PRI, PRI is a free market think tank based here in uh, California. We have offices in Pasadena and Sacramento. We were founded in 1979, and we put out uh, all sorts of free market analysis and research and studies and media commentaries on a variety of issues, including medical economics and innovation and the topic of today's uh, forum. Uh, one little bit of housekeeping for you. Our presenters are going to um, share their thoughts throughout this webinar. But we want to get your questions as well. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers throughout uh, our webinar today, use the Zoom chat function, which is somewhere in the middle of your screen down there. And I'll keep an eye out for your questions, and I will ask them later on in our program. So uh, to kind of set the stage for today, you know, biosimilars, um, we're already seeing a little bit of the promise of them. They generated $19 billion uh, in savings value in today's dollars in 2023, but there's still obstacles in the current drug pricing system, which meant that we're leaving billions of dollars in potential savings on the table. And so our discussion today will focus how potential reforms uh, can improve competition, generate more savings, and really better serve patients and taxpayers. And we have a terrific lineup of uh, experts who are going to share their uh, thoughts and research and perspective today. We have uh, with us uh, uh, Craig Burton, who is the Senior Vice President for Policy and Strategic Alliances for the Association for Accessible Medicines. And he's also the Executive Director of the Biosimilars Council. And in his role, Craig's responsible for leading policy development and issues management for AAM and for directing the Biosimilars Council and building relationships with strategic partners in the, the healthcare sector. We also have uh, Conrad Bamani, who's with the, uh, now I'm going to get this wrong, so I'm going to let Conrad say, how do you say it? The IQVIA Institute. The IQVIA Institute, uh, and he's a manager with the IQVIA Institute, and his key areas of interest include healthcare policy, market access, and economic modeling. And he's authored or contributed to multiple reports on long-term biosimilar sustainability, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and other areas of US healthcare policy. So we're thrilled to have Conrad join us today. And kicking things off is our Dr. Wayne Weingarten. And Wayne is the director of PRI Center for Medical Economics and Innovation. He's also a senior fellow in business and economics here at PRI. And his research focuses on the connection between macroeconomic policies and economic outcomes with a focus on fiscal policy and the healthcare industry and the energy sector. He does a lot of uh, our work in this, uh, in this sphere. He's written many um, books and studies and papers and authored, authors regular media commentaries and does regular media interviews, you know, discussing all of these issues related to uh, uh, issues like biosimilars. And he's going to start off with kind of an overview of presentation setting the stage. So with that, Wayne, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Tim, and, and welcome, everyone. We're so, so glad you uh, tuned in. Uh, like Tim said, what I'd like to do, and I'm going to put up a, a PowerPoint slide right now, is just give a very quick overview so that we're all on the same page in terms of exactly what biologics are, why biosimilars are so important, how they save money, uh, and really just set up the, the panel for a discussion about what obstacles still remain and what changes need to be made so that we can actually generate more savings and we can actually make this market even stronger than it's been. 
So if we if we start from uh, the beginning, we're going to do a, a biology lesson from an economist. But when we're looking at you know what what are biologics, uh, and and these differ from traditional medicines. And you know, to step back, this is really a, an exciting time in the healthcare field in terms of all of the amazing treatments that are being developed. We have exciting gene therapies, we have mRNA uh, types of treatments. We have our traditional medicines, which are usually chemical based, uh, small molecules. Well, biologics are, are, are an important part of this, this group of medicines. And these are medicines that are produced from or contain living organisms. That's biology, bio, uh, biologics, for that. biologics, there's the word. Uh, and the, these are important treatments. But when we look at all the advancements we've had in cancer or psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, biologics, are the medicines that have made these advancements possible. Now, typically they're much more complicated than traditional medicines because as opposed to dealing with uh, chem uh, chemicals, you're dealing with uh, biological processes, uh, but they have an incredible value in terms of treatment. Biosimilars role is in terms of creating competition. Uh, it, 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 the parallel that's used, and it's exactly precise, but it's, it's a good parallel, is what the generics have been towards branded medicines. And generic medicines have been an incredibly important competitor once the uh, branded medicine has had an opportunity to recoup its cost of capital, then you have uh, uh, generics come in, they compete down the price, and they create uh, an incredible amount of um, affordability. That's exactly the process that biosimilars do. These are medicines, they don't have clinically meaningful differences, uh, just like the slide says, in safety, purity, and effectiveness relative to its uh, reference originator. And so that competitive process that we see with generics, that's what biosimilars do in terms of the biologic market. They bring competition into um, the space. Oh, and Wayne, we're actually not seeing your slide. Do you want to hit share your screen so we can... Oh, I apologize. I, um, I will. That probably would make it work better. Are you seeing it now, Tim? There we go. Yep. I apologize for that. So, picking up where I said, why is biosimilar competition important? And it, it's essential because we're, pr we're promoting two potentially conflicting goals. And these are incredibly important goals because they represent two different types of patients, right? We need to encourage innovation because despite all of the great uh, advancements we've made, we don't have treatments for Alzheimer's. Muscular dystrophy is desperately in need of treatments. We can't cure pancreatic cancer yet. So we need a lot more innovation. We also need affordability, right? That the, the whole idea of um, you know, making healthcare more affordable is incredibly important because patients with diseases need access to those medicines. So we need to balance these two goals. And, and one of the problems that we've had or we've seen is that we're, we're looking more towards price controls and price controls are focusing on affordability and are focusing on patients that currently have treatments to the detriment of patients who don't have treatments and to the detriment of innovation. And the great thing about competition is that it creates a, a better balance between these goals, where it incents innovation by creating an opportunity for the innovators to recoup their cost of capital. But then it also incents competition that promotes affordability. And so the biosimilar competition is incredibly important because it allows these medicines that are, um, are important for treating new diseases that innovation to continue while also promoting affordability uh, in those spaces where it's, where it's um, uh, imp uh, possible. And what's really impressive when you look at what generics have done, you know, does competition work? The generic space demonstrates that competition, it, it does work and it creates uh, billions of dollars of savings and, and Craig can speak to this much better than I can. But we're talking about 90% of all medicines prescribed today are generics right now. 
And most generics are going to cost somewhere between $20 and $25. So you, you're talking about most medicines are generics. Most generics are affordable. So competition is working. But those medicines that were once branded, they had an opportunity to recoup the cost of capital. And so this process, this full circle of incenting both innovation and promoting affordability, it works. We, we have a demonstrated market where this works. When you look at biosimilars, we're also seeing that as this market is developing, that it's working for the biologic space as well. I'm going to move this out of the way so you can fully see the chart. Uh, what we've done here, this is the results of a, of a recent PRI analysis that looked at the cost savings from biosimilars. And we've done several analyses of this. Acuvia, uh, they've done many analyses on these. Uh, and most of the analyses, they come up with you know, different data, but they're coming up with similar numbers in terms of what the types of savings are. And so in our, our most recent analysis, we were looking at 10 commonly prescribed biologics, two of which didn't really have competition. One, Enbrel, there is no biosimilar comp competitor yet because it's still on patent. Uh, and the second one, Humira, uh, which is best-selling drug in the world, and biosimilar competition has had a harder time getting established in this market for many of the reasons we're going to talk about in the panel. And so what we looked at, we looked at the prices, and this is just a summary. We've done each by each biologic class. So if you look at the study, you can see more detailed results. But in this, we're looking at just the average, just kind of get a sense of what's going on. And in the red line, we're looking at just those that had competition. So we took out uh, Humira and Enbrel and looked at what happened to prices over time, um, waiting by how much uh, of the drug is used. And you can see that prices adjusted for inflation because given the recent ballot of inflation, that was an important consideration. Price inflation adjusted prices have fallen by more than half where there's been biosimilar competition. But importantly, without competition, prices adjusted for inflation continue to rise. So Humira's and Embro's prices went up, no competition prices were increasing with biosimilar competition, they declined. So when you put those in, the, there's still a price decline. It looks less dramatic because without the competition, you don't see the price declines, um, again, showing the power of biosimilar uh, competition. When we look at savings, and again, in the paper, we looked at it adjusted for inflation. I thought it might be useful to see it in today's dollars uh, to get a sense of you know, what's those savings compared to the cost of groceries today. And we looked at it in a couple of ways. One, we looked at current savings, right? So th this is this, that's the state of what the current market is. Um, and given kind of the pricing of today, compared to what we kind of created in our baseline, which was prices would continue to grow in the same way they had before competition. So I suppose you have the rising prices uh, without competition and the declining prices with competition. I use the same volumes across both. And what you see is that over this, you know, by 2023, you have generated $19 billion of savings compared to what you would have been spending. So you would have been spending $19 billion more had um, there been no competition. And this is similar that people do different methodologies, but it's similar to kind of other results that we're generating tens of billions of dollars with the current products. Um, this is looking at just eight of them. Uh, on the market and that biosimilar competition is working. The larger number, $35 billion, that's kind of a forward-looking number. And that's looking at, well, what if uh, we had the same biosimilar share and the same assumptions for Humira and Enbrel? And what kind of potential is out there? Kind of gives a forward-looking, if we can get this market to work, what are the savings out there? And because both of those drugs are such blockbusters and they're used so uh, prolifically, you can see the savings, you know, nearly double to $35 billion. So that the, the amount of savings that we could be generating if we can stand up a biosimilar market where there's evidence that we can is, is quite extraordinary. It has the power to kind of, to use that term, bend the cost curve, which is incredibly important. The issues are, and this is really what, what the panel is going to be talking about for the, for the remainder of the, of the webinar, is that there are still obstacles. There are concerns that the market could uh, not reach its potential. There could be um, uh, disincentives to even continue in the market. 
And so that we need to get those rules of the game correct. We need to get that policy correct. So that way we can stand up the biosimilars market and again, have the ability to both promote innovation and promote affordability. And that really needs to be our, our, our most important goals when we're talking about kind of how, how do we set the right policy environment for not just biosimilars, but drugs, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn things back over to Tim. Terrific. Thank you, Wayne. And again, to everyone who's uh, tuning in today, if you have questions uh, for any of our panelists, make sure you uh, put them in the Zoom Q&A function at the, at the bottom of your screen there, and I will uh, ask as many as we can get to uh, uh, toward the end of our uh, webinar today. So let's open it up now, and let's start with uh, a question for Craig. So, you know, Wayne's presentation just now really focused on the potential savings that have been possible based on biosimilars that have already been approved. But there's a lot of exciting biosimilar innovation that's under development right now. So maybe you could uh, share with our listeners uh, today, you know, what is the future for biosimilar innovation look like? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks for the question. Thanks for having me uh, on, on this. Um, I think Wayne, Wayne really touched on the value of biosimilars and, and I, but I, I think that's worth uh, emphasizing, you know, if, if you think about the success story we've had with generic drugs, we've seen that that competition through generic drugs, you know, generates savings, encourages continued innovation, creates space for, for new innovation, um, and it expands patient access. And we're, we're seeing that um, even with the challenges that Wayne noticed, we're, we're seeing uh, that come true with biosimilars as well. Uh, we're seeing lower costs. We're seeing greater patient access. Um, in 2023, for instance, uh, 2023 alone, uh, the use of biosimilars saved $12 billion um, across the U.S. Importantly, though, we're also seeing in almost every single market that a biosimilar has entered, the overall patient access has expanded. Um, uh, and, and when you, when you quantify that by patient days, it, it, um, uh, turns into over almost 500 million days of patient therapy that have been generated because of biosimilar competition, because of lower prices, making these medicines more accessible to patients, um, 500 million days of patient therapy that would not have occurred without, uh, biosimilars on the market. Um, so, so, so definitely that promise is there. Um, you know, the, 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 the savings are real. The, the issue as, as Wayne noted is how you create the, the rules of the game to provide that predictability so that, uh, biosimilars can get on the market, can compete, can, uh, have that sustainable market long-term. Um, and as you look at that pipeline, there are, um, I believe, last last check, uh, FDA had noted that there were, uh, um, you know, a number, at least 90 uh, biosimilar development programs uh, underway. Um, the FDA continues to work with bi uh, manufacturers on potential biosimilars. You know, these are products that will treat conditions, you know, for autoimmune conditions, osteoporosis, asthma, Crohn's, uh, arthritis, you know, a range of conditions um, that patients that patients face. Um, but the 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 interesting and unfortunate thing is that you know that that pipeline, yeah, you know, there there are a lot of biosimilars in that pipeline, but there are not as many as there should be. There are a lot of products that uh, brand biologic products with annual sales of several billion dollars per year. So we're not talking small change here, um, that, that could have biosimilars, uh, biosimilar competition, but for which there are no biosimilars in development. And that really comes back to creating those, those clear rules of the game, creating that clear predictability, uh, you know, in everything from, the FDA approval process, streamlining that, um, 
addressing patent thickets, addressing coverage and reimbursement, um, and as well as you have to have a conversation around the price setting approach that's set in IRA. And I know we'll talk about that, but you know, some of the implications that that has for future investment. So Wayne, um, I know there are many uh, obstacles that make it uh, difficult for biosimilars to uh, effectively compete with the reference biologic as, as Craig was just mentioning here. Could you give us a, a top line overview of what these obstacles are and how they discourage the use of lower cost medicines? Yeah, taking a top line, and we'll, we'll dig into these uh, as we go along, but the, the, the biggest problem, I think the guide in terms of how do we reform uh, or improve the system is looking at the incentives because we have such a complicated system that the incentives of all the different parties keep getting misaligned. Um, and, and remember, you know, usually in a transaction, it's, it's very simple, right? You have, you know, the, you take a grocery store, you have the farmer who sells to the grocer, who sells to the consumer, there may be a distributor in there between, but it's much more simple. Here, what we're talking about is you have the doctor and the patient, but you also have the clinic and the clinic's interest can sometimes conflict with what the doctor wants to do. You have the pharmacy benefit manager who may or may not be part of the insurance company who then is negotiating with the manufacturer on behalf of the insurer. <laughs> we also then have the distributor. And you can see there's all of these different parties in kind of in the room together. And on top of that, you have a, a pricing system that's very complex. It's very opaque. You have rebates, but the rebates don't necessarily go to uh, patients, they kind of go into the broader system uh, and that changes the incentives. And so because of kind of the complexity of the transaction itself and the opacity of the pricing system, we have the, the incentives are now misaligned. And with those misaligned incentives, what we're now seeing to a large extent is that what's the interest of the clinic may not be what, what the doctor wants to do. The doctor's interest, you know, uh, is which, which should be the main voice, may not get through the patient. What they want and their kind of incentives in the game is being completely muted. Uh, middlemen, like pharmacy benefit managers and payers, their interests are neither aligned, nor the doctor, could be with the clinic, may not be. And I know this is getting confusing, and I'm kind of doing that on purpose because that's a big part of the problem. And so when we look at all, all we, and we start digging down into the details of, well, how did this crazy thing happen? Or why are rebates, which really should be helping customers, not helping them? It's because of this fundamental excessive complexity and opaque prices that misaligned incentives. Conrad, uh, a question for you. As we dig deeper into the problems of this buy and bill payment system for infused biologics, a recent uh, IQVIA report that you co-authored um, documents how commercial payer rebates can discourage the use of lower cost biosimilars that are used in clinical settings. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get a rebate offer, I think that's usually a pretty good thing. So could you explain here what's going on and how text is encouraging the use of higher cost medicines that are infused in a clinical setting. Sure. Thank you, Tim. And thank you uh, once again for having me on today. Um, so as you mentioned, we do have a recent report uh, that tried to put some data-driven conclusions around the impact of the current healthcare policy system on the long-term sustainability of specifically infused biosimilars. Now, as it pertains to rebates here, um, of course, for a biosimilar uptake, attaining access is crucial for biosimilars to be sustainable in the long term. And the rebate system as it is can encourage the use of higher cost infused medicines in situations where rebate walls might exist. Now, a rebate wall occurs when a drug manufacturer provides a list price discount to health plans or PBMs based on achieving preferred formulary status or even having an exclusive contract. These rebates can be contingent on blocking the entry of competition into the market, 
And these can occur when the projected initial loss of rebates from the reference product negates the potential for overall savings that are offered by the biosimilars. This practice uh, then reduces uh, product choices for the patient, provider, as well as payers. Uh, as um, Wayne was mentioning, the misalignment of incentives there. Uh, and it can also discourage that price competition that biosimilars promise. Now, I will note that uh, rebates and the numbers behind them are kind of closely guarded secrets in the industry. There's definitely a lack of transparency here. But as we tried to put some data and empirical evidence behind this, we looked at the case of infliximab in our report. Uh, and it has been suggested that rebate walls were one of the reasons that biosimilars had slow uptake in the infliximab market. So what we did here was we looked across the uh, US patients across the country and uh, specifically looking at commercial plans here. And we wanted to understand the proportion of US patients whose formulary or whose plan preferred the originator Remicade uh, as opposed to the biosimilars once they entered the market. And we found here that the originator Remicade was preferred for over 85% of patients until about 2020. Only in 2021 did that inflection point hit where one, but not all of the biosimilars reached higher preferred proportion than the originator. So this only happened for one out of the three biosimilars that were already on the market. So it was also in 2021 when the overall market share finally began to shift substantially to these biosimilars, which were essentially scraping the bottom of the barrel up until that point. The key thing here is that those biosimilars launched more than four years prior. So that's a four year gap in which the higher cost originator product was preferred by the majority of these formularies um, until uh, these biosimilars finally began to gain some traction. So this was looking at commercial plans uh, specifically. When looking at formularies in Medicare, these were generally more welcoming of biosimilars in this uh, case, but the uptake in Medicare was similarly slow, which was indicating kind of a reflection of the commercial formulary status there. So really, uh, this is an example where uh, rebates can actually cause the higher cost product or the originator reference product to maintain that market share for a longer period of time. At least in the infused space, we were finding that this has become less common since the case of infliximab, which is good, but it's still possible to occur. And dynamics around rebates can also have other negative impacts for infused biosimilars in other ways, which I think we'll, we'll get to. Great. And as a reminder to everyone watching, if you have any questions for our panelists, make sure to type them out in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and I will ask your questions as they come in. So a uh, question for Craig, you know, kind of expanding on this uh, discussion of the flaws with the rebate system, can you uh, explain maybe a little broader how rebates, you know, something that generally would reduce costs for consumers, you would think, actually encourages the use of, uh, of more expensive medicines? And how are patients harmed by this? Yeah, Tim, so, so a couple of thoughts. And, and, and I also want to go back to, to Wayne's point about the, the, the misalignment of incentives. And that really is the core issue as we think about a lot of these. Now, that said, I think it's on the one hand, it's it's okay and appropriate for us to be impatient and, and perhaps frustrated by that. But I also think it shouldn't be surprising, right? The, you're going to have this when you're creating a brand new market, right? And and when Congress created the pathway for uh, for the approval of biosimilars, let's be blunt, Congress put far less, you know, there was far less energy put into, you know, uh, thinking through and aligning those incentives for adoption of biosimilars. Um, you know, I think it was kind of an assumed that they would work it out. Well, you 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 got to make sure the alignment, that the incentives are aligned to drive the behavior and the results that you want. Um, put another way, right now, whether we like it or not, our system is perfectly designed to deliver the results we're getting. You know, so if we want to change that, we got to change those incentives. You know, wh what that means in terms of rebates. Um, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. If if you go 
to if you go buy something and it, it has a rebate offer attached, you send it in, you get the rebate, great, you win, right? But that's not the way it works with drugs, right? Because you're not necessarily the one, even though you have a copay when you pick it up from the pharmacy, it's your it's that PBM that's paying for that for that rebate and so or for that drug. And they're the ones who cut the deal to get a rebate uh, on the use of it. Um, and so they get to decide what to do with that money. Uh, and, and, you know, overwhelmingly those rebates are not passed through to the patient. Those rebates, uh, are shared between generally shared between the PBM and the health plan. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe very unclear, uh, maybe shared with the employer. Um, I think a lot of employers would tell you they're not confident that they're receiving the 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 you know the rebates that are due to them um generally those those rebates stay between the pbm and the health plan i think the bulk of them are passed through to the health plan but keep in mind you know pbms and health plans overwhelmingly are highly integrated so you know it's there's a little bit of moving money from my right hand uh you know my right pocket to my left pocket um that doesn't benefit a, a customer that means a customer is going to pay uh, their copay based on a list price that may be higher, even when that rebate is bringing the later cost to the health plan down. But the but the patient isn't getting the value of that. Um, now, what that can mean is uh, you know, creating some weird and and you know unfortunate incentives when it comes to PBM behavior. It, it can mean that they prefer higher cost products with higher high rebates over lower cost products, even when they have a lower net cost. Um, yeah, so, so, so at the end of the day, patient loses, but the, the PBM and the health plan are winning, so. So um, as, Wayne established earlier, you know, Humira is the best-selling drug in the world, which is why having a vibrant market for biosimilars to compete with Humira is important. Yeah. Have these problems with the rebate system that you just described impacted the recent launch of biosimilars competing with Humira? Uh, they have undoubtedly affected the, the launch of those biosimilars. Um but it is not limited to Humira. So, so a couple thoughts there. Um, as we think about that Humira launch, um, we had in 2023, nine biosimilar uh, versions of Humira launch with list prices of as much as 80, I believe 86, I believe there's some that are even greater discount, um, but, but 80 to 85, 86% lower prices than the brand product. Um, at the end of 2023, those products, all of biosimilars had a whopping 2% market share. If you look at the, the revenue that um, the brand manufacturer uh, uh, recorded on Humira, their uh, their their gross revenue went up. They actually sold more. Their net revenue uh, uh, de declined by about forty percent. You know, you can figure out where that money went. Um, that was more money going in the form of rebates to the PBMs, and in particular the big three PBMs. What we saw, we've done a lot of work um, tracking the um the the launch of those biosimilar uh, versions of Humira um working with our friends over at uh, at IQvia um that we've published that's available on our website um yeah i mentioned 2% market share the adoption that happened in 23 in 2023 was overwhelmingly smaller PBMs, smaller health plans that were not dependent on rebates. So think about, uh, you know, for instance, Kaiser Permanente moved about 97% of 
their uh, utilization to, to the biosimilars within weeks of biosimilar launch. And they generated significant savings based on that. They're not alone. There are other success stories like that. But keep in mind, the big three PBMs control roughly 80 plus percent of the market. Um, and those big three PBMs did not uh, did not drive coverage of the biosimilar Humira. Um, you know, why might that be? We actually looked, you know, with, you know, with Icubia and, and what you see when you dig into the numbers around the biosimilar adoption is that sticking with the brand product resulted in about $6 billion in lost savings just in 2023. This is savings that employers could have benefited from. The reason, of course, back to your question of why, is because when you look at how the dollar flows here, those PBMs and the integrated specialty pharmacies would have lost about $2 billion. So they retained their, their uh, revenue, but it came at a loss to, um, to employers. Um, two other quick points on that, because um, we could spend a long time just talking about Humira. Um, first of all, it's also important you think about the role of bu uh, bundled rebates and what, what they call product topping. What I mean by that is um, if you, again, if you look at the Humira market, the brand and all of the biosimilars, the total, the total, um, the total market in terms of prescriptions has been shrinking in the last couple of years. And this is, but this is not because patients are getting cured because this is for a chronic condition. What is happening is that those rebates are creating preferred formulary placement for newer expensive brand products, allowing, allowing the brand to shift patients from Humira to their newer brand products instead of to lower cost biosimilars. And, and this, this is a real challenge. Last point, this is not unique to Humira. We've seen this in other markets. Um, we've seen this with insulin. Um, if you, you look at the insulin market, when a biosimilar entered, we saw um, in the period we were monitoring, we saw two thirds of the written prescriptions were for the biosimilar, but that biosimilar was only filled one third of the time. The rest of the time, the PBMs denied that, that prescription and pushed the patient back to the higher cost brand product. So, so those rebates play a critical role in patient access. Conrad, a question for you. You know, another issue that you raise in the IQVIA report is the declining uh, average sale prices, which can discourage the use of lower cost biosimilars. Now, that seems a little counterintuitive to me. So could you explain what's going on here and how declining prices can discourage the use of lower cost biosimilars? Yep. So, um, when we're talking about the infused biosimilar space, it's a little bit different than the pharmacy side with Humira, for example, in that there's now another stakeholder in the mix in this ecosystem that's also impacted by um, this money moving around, uh, as Wayne referred to. And those are the providers. So providers do purchase these products and keep them in their inventory. And once they uh, administer them to patients, then they are reimbursed for the price of the product itself, and then some to cover some of their overhead costs. So a lot of these reimbursements for providers are based upon the average sales price or the ASP. And this is a metric that CMS or the government pu publishes every quarter. So if you look at a chart of average sales prices uh, for all of the products within a given market or within a given molecule, once biosimilars enter, it very obviously becomes kind of a race to the bottom as uh, all of these average sales prices are decreasing uh, because these manufacturers are providing further and further rebates to payers or PBMs, 
as well as further and further discounts to the providers themselves in order to remain competitive with one another. Now, intuitively, this dynamic of decreasing average sales prices is good for the healthcare system as savings are increasing, the average sales price of the molecule as a whole is decreasing rapidly. However, one thing to note in terms of the provider uh, reimbursement dynamics and their net cost recovery for these products is that the ASP or the average sales price, average sales price that's published by the government is inclusive of both discounts given to providers as well as the rebates given to payers. So what this can turn into is a situation where providers are being reimbursed for the price that includes the rebates to the payers, and they're actually left underwater uh, in terms of uh, what they purchase the drug for. In the case where biosimilars are entering the market and uh, everyone is racing to the bottom or trying to remain competitive on that price, uh, generally the originator uh, may start with a higher price and it can incentivize uh, providers to go with the more costly product because they won't be left underwater or uh, at a loss for that uh, higher cost product. How this happens is, of course, uh, as time goes on, the competition between these biosimilars and the originator causes further and further rebates given to payers for access, and then it's more underground, uh, underwater for the providers. And then the providers expect more and more discounts, uh, as well as these rebates going to payers. And it creates kind of a, a never-ending down spiral of the ASP, and it's not uh, sustainable. So kind of to re reiterate here, this is suggesting that inherently the system is leading to consistent reductions in this average sales price, which is a good thing for short-term savings. But in the long run, it can lead to providers not choosing biosimilars or it can lead to manufacturers not being able to sustain the required discounts and rebates that are being asked of them. Craig, let's talk about something that's been in the news a lot lately, of course, and that's the Inflation Reduction Act and the price controls on drugs that are contained within the law. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, not only will they um, discourage the development of new innovative medicines, but it's also going to discourage the uh, development of biosimilars. So can you kind of walk us through how does the IRA discourage competition and what are the consequences of this? Yeah, thanks, Tim. I, yeah, so we've gotten that question a lot because the, the, the legislation um, purportedly exempts a product from price negotiation once a biosimilar enters the market. And, and so, you know, as the argument goes, biosimilars should be okay, right? This doesn't hurt them. Not, not so fast. It's not quite as easy as that. So um, in a word, the issue is uncertainty. Right. If if businesses and markets need one thing, it is certainty. And the IRA um, uh, dramatically reduces the certainty for biosimilars. Um, what I mean what I mean by that, biosimilar to back back up. Biosimilar development is not inexpensive. It costs anywhere between a hundred to three hundred million dollars. Uh, um, based on manufacturer experience to date. That investment is happening happening years prior, is as many as 10, 10, 11 years before the biosimilar comes to market. So at the time that a biosimilar uh, manufacturer is, is weighing whether to invest in a new biosimilar, they have no way of predicting what... Uh, a negotiated price will be. Because keep in mind, the IRA doesn't say there's no formula for a negotiated price. The IRA simply tells HHS to seek the lowest possible price. And all of the power, all of the authority in that uh, price uh, setting process is held by HHS. So you're, you're asking now a manufacturer, buy a similar manufacturer, is having to, as they're weighing a potential return on investment and whether whether the market will be big enough to sustain, uh, you know, to give them the return on capital from a $300 million investment. Now they're going to have to figure out uh, uh, what 
the result of an inherently political price setting process is going to look like. You're asking them literally to 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 project decisions that are going to be made by a future presidential administration that is two and a half administrations in the future. Um, you know, to 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 give you give you some experience, you know, some context for that. I don't think anyone in uh, 2008 thought that we would be uh, having an election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump in 2020. Much less could have predicted the the result of a of a a price setting exercise that would have come about as a result of that. So so it. it it almost forces biosimilar manufacturers to assume that they're going to be entering into a market against a product with a, a negotiated price. Okay, well, then what's the problem? Keep in mind, IRA guarantees that brand product formulary coverage um, uh, you know, for the first year. And so, so the way this, the statute is constructed severely undermines the opportunity for biosimilar manufacturers and severely undermines the um, ability of them to forecast uh, uh, and make those investment decisions. Wayne, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the problems today, but we want to look forward to the future and to uh, kind of end on a positive note. What are um, some of the types of reforms that policymakers should be considering that could promote greater use of biosimilars? And, you know, can these changes significantly, quote, bend the cost curve for medicines? Um, to start with the, the, the second question, yes. Uh, with the biosimilars, I think they, it's they demonstrated that it has the ability to bend the cost curve. And because of that, we really need to focus on the problems that Conrad and Craig have been highlighting because specifically those savings are there. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars of savings. I mean, what you're talking about with some of these numbers we've been throwing around just to give perspective, the, it's about the growth in total drug spending. So if you've got all of these savings in a year, you would see drug spending, the increase be flattened. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about major changes in the, the growth in spending. So what do you do? I mean, obviously, I think we've we've laid out the roadmap in terms of you got to address the payment system, especially with the drugs that are being infused in the buy and bill system. You've got to address the rebates uh, and, and address the problem of rebate walls. You've got to address the Inflation Reduction Act, kind of working backwards with the IRA. I mean, my my politically naive solution is we got to repeal the IRA or certainly repeal the um the price control or price negotiation authority. Uh, politically naive, but that is the, the correct economic answer, if I could say. Um, the, the, the political answer is we need to address, Craig was talking about that uncertainty, and we need to address that uncertainty. We need to provide much better guidance in statute so that a biosimilar knows 10 years prior that if they're successful, the, there will be no price drug negotiation. Uh, so we, we need to address that certainty. With with the rebates, um, that's a very complicated issue. It addresses things well beyond simply biosimilars. But we need to address the rebate walls either directly by, uh, you, I mean, the contracting that's used in terms of these rebate walls are, uh, are in any other market would be considered anti, you know, be an antitrust issue. Uh, so we either need to apply that um, to uh, the the drug market, or in my sense, in my ideal, reform the rebate system completely. If we can get to a net pricing model where rebates have to go to the patients, and we end up with focusing on net prices uh, rather than list prices, that would go a long way to addressing uh, the rebate issue. If we're talking about uh, the buy and bill system, again, it's stability, it's certainty. Ideally, we want to de-link the providers. Um, markup uh, from the cost of the drug. I mean, if it's a fixed fee or something of, of that nature where the provider's incentives are no longer aligned with higher prices, um, th that becomes an incredibly important reform because right now uh, the clinics do better. And I think a lot of this is an administrative decision, not a, a health professional decision, but the clinics do better 
when the prices are higher and when you're already you know drowning in all sorts of red tape and you're barely making money you know it just becomes fiscally uh impossible to change so we need to to de-link uh the the clinic so that they their remuneration does not change whether or not what regardless of which uh drug that they uh that they use Okay, let's close with a few questions from the audience, and we'll open this up to um, anyone on the panel who wishes to chime in. So one question, you know, something that hasn't been discussed really today is the impact that lower cost biosimilars can have on patient out-of-pocket costs. So could you discuss that? And also, you know, are there any inefficiencies here? So, I mean... There are absolutely some inefficiencies here. Um, you know, I, I think it going back to Conrad talked about the difference between uh, infused versus uh, self-administered products. You know, medical benefit versus retail pharmacy benefit, um, uh, and and that's really going to affect that. I think what we've seen in um, those those provider administered products is they don't typically affect patient out of pocket. Now, part of that's because of insurance design. Part of that is because, for instance, in Medicare, a lot of patients have um, uh, uh, supplemental Medicare coverage that that covers those copays. So, so yeah, in in those settings, patients are already kind of insulated from the cost. Where it can really play a role is in those pharmacy benefit products like Humira, like insulin, where a patient's copay is based on the list price. You know, that's where a lot of times their copay is, whether it's a, a flat number or whether it's a percentage of their of the list price. Um, that's where a patient's going to see that uh, that impact, um, uh, and that's where. Um, you know, adoption has been slowed. Now, I, I, I will say we have seen just in the last six months, we have seen those big PBMs, CVS specifically, jump in in a big way with Humira um, and really encourage, all of a sudden create those incentives for patients to, to use the lower cost biosimilar. And they've shifted a lot of the utilization to the biosimilar. So it's clearly possible um uh you know as long as you again create those incentives uh you know where it's in their interest yeah well said craig and i think one of the things we also highlight in our report is that exactly as you said patients don't see the savings that these biosimilars are introducing to the healthcare system um because of these assistance programs or supplemental insurance patients are generally facing low costs across the board um, for the higher cost products as well as the biosimilars. So there's no mechanism in place for patients to get that pass through of lower cost or healthcare savings by choosing that biosimilar. So I think uh, we have time for one more question and I think this is a good one to close on and kind of keep everything in perspective. So from a long-term sustainability perspective, what will the consequences be from not addressing the obstacles that we've talked about and the barriers that we've talked about uh, in our discussion here today? I think Craig touched on this uh, as well with the question on the impact of the IRA, but over a longer horizon, uh, there's definitely a much larger risk to the sustainability of the biosimilar system that can emerge. Um, now, at least in the infused space in our report, we kind of boil it down to the current ASP system, the average sales price system that uh, was not designed with biosimilars in mind. And at this point, it's uh, you know no longer unprecedented to have biosimilars in markets, right? It's been almost eight, 10 years in many cases. And the theme of these misaligned incentives could eventually lead to uh, scenarios where, as Craig mentioned, manufacturers are looking at their pipeline and thinking, well, in nine or 10 or 11 years, when we can finally get this biosimilar to the market, is it going to be dead on arrival? Are we going to be scraping the bottom of the barrel uh, with this? And is it worth uh, pursuing this? 
So thinking about long-term, if uh, these biosimilars eventually are withdrawn from the market or are chosen not to enter altogether, then that promise of savings that biosimilars uh, seem to have at their outset may not be realized. I think definitely some sort of policy change is required here, and it needs to consider the needs or the incentives of all the stakeholders in the system. So um, the payers or the PBMs, the manufacturers, the providers, as well as the patients, and really align those incentives uh, for everyone to be able to choose the lower cost biosimilar and optimize those health system savings in the long run. I, th I think Conrad touched, did a good job touching on it. I, I would add two, two thoughts. One, you know, employers are going to bear the cost of this. If you know, we're talking about savings as an abstract, that's dollars and cents to employers. It's it's their it's their uh, health care benefit costs, um, and if we if we don't align those incentives, you're going to have fewer biosimilars. You're going to have slower biosimilar entry, and employers are going to are going to foot that bill um, uh, uh, as well as taxpayers through the Medicare program. Secondly, it's going to affect patient access, right? Let let let's you know. We talked about how biosimilars are are expanding patient access, um, you know, particularly in a price setting world. If you think about IRA, where these brand prices are set and are going to be ratcheted down over time by HHS as it determines what those prices should be, um, it's implausible to think that brand companies are going to stay in those markets forever with a negotiated price. You need biosimilars to come in and fill that gap as you know and create that space for new brand innovation. Without that, um, you know, this cycle that you have of both innovation and access is really going to be broken up. Well, gentlemen, on that point, thank you so much to to you, all of our panelists for joining us today. Thank you all who tuned in for, for watching. If you're interested in learning more about our work on biosimilars and our other work on, on drug pricing, go to medecon.org. That's medecon.org. That has all the work of uh, our Wayne Weingarten and our Center for Medical Economics and Innovation. The video from today's webinar will also be up there later this day. So if you wish to go back and, and watch it again or share with our colleagues, um, the, this video will be there to watch at your leisure. So thank you again for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Have a great day.